Let's turn again to 1 Peter and chapter 2. 1 Peter and chapter 2. And we'll read from verse 1. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men. But in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in scripture, behold I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honour is for you who believe. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offence. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you were a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. It's the verses 9 and 10 that I want to focus on this morning with the Lord's help. And the message is entitled, Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? It's not an original title. You may recognize it. It comes from the popular TV series when some well-known faces trace their ancestry and along the way discover perhaps some secrets and surprises uh, in their background. So who do you think you are? Where have you come from? Why are you here? What is the purpose of life? Well, these are some of the questions that Peter here answers in our passage before us today. Who do you think you are? You are, Peter says, a chosen race. Now remember that Peter was writing to the elect exiles of the dispersion, believers who were scattered because of persecution, Christians who were suffering for their faith. They were New Testament exiles, really the equivalent of the Old Testament exiles, who were taken away from their homeland to a strange land to a people who spoke a strange language, to Babylon. And so these New Testament Christians have also been scattered. They are exiles, living far from home. They had every reason to be discouraged and demoralized because they appeared in the eyes of the world to be an insignificant minority. They were dispersed, living, living like refugees. They were outcasts. They were feeling ragged and torn, no doubt. And Peter writes to them, not a sympathy letter, but rather a letter of encouragement. And really the gist of the letter and of this passage before us this morning is remember who you are. Remember who you are. So who are you? Peter writes, verse 9, But you, but you are a chosen race. That is, in distinction 
from those who stumbled over the cornerstone, from those who rejected Christ and fall to their grief. You are not in that category. You have not rejected Christ. You have believed. The Lord has called you effectually to himself. You are a chosen race. And when Paul uses these phrases, they're all, when Peter uses these phrases, they're all chosen quite deliberately. They're all culled from the Old Testament. And uh, here there's a reference to the passage we read from Deuteronomy chapter 7. When Peter says, you are a chosen race, he reminds the New Testament church, these New Testament believers, that they are, as it were, a continuation of the church in the Old Testament. We read there in Deuteronomy 7, you, for you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who were on the face of the earth. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. For you were the fewest of all people, but it is because the Lord loves you. So the Lord set his love upon ancient Israel, not because of its size, because of its riches, because of its influence, because of any inherent goodness within the nation. Indeed, on the international scale, Israel was just like a postage stamp compared to all the giant empires that seemed always to overshadow tiny Israel. Little Israel was less than the size of Tasmania and was always threatened by those giants around Egypt and Assyria and Babylon and Persia. And so internationally, Israel was insignificant. But what gave Israel significance is the fact that God, the eternal sovereign God, the triune God, set his love upon this tiny insignificant nation. And God entered into a special covenant with them. And God gave them his law. He sent his prophets. Indeed, it was out of Israel that God gave the Savior, the Lord Jesus, because salvation is from the Jews. And so it was only because of what God chose to do in and through Israel that it gave Israel significance. And Peter, now writing to persecuted, scattered New Testament Christians, he says, you are a chosen race. Words which would have brought much comfort and encouragement to believers who were suffering. And the same, Christian friend, is true for you and for me today. We are part of this chosen race. It's a staggering thought that before we chose the Lord, the Lord chose us. Jesus said to his disciples, you didn't choose me, rather I chose you. And the Apostle Paul writes in Ephesians 1, he says, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the will, the purpose of his will. So God chose us. There's therefore no room for pride. It's not because he chose us because of our shining faces, our shining lives. It's not because he chose us because there was something special about us or we were better than our neighbours. We weren't. But he chose us just because he chose us. He chose us for his own special reason. 
He chose us for his own glory. And it's that and that alone that gives us significance and value. So it's not what we own. It's not who we are or what we are or what we've achieved. But a simple fact that you are a chosen people. A chosen race. Chosen for salvation. Chosen by God the Father. And God the Father sent his Son, the Lord Jesus, to die for us. And the Father and the Son have sent his, the, the Holy Spirit to abide in our hearts, to assure us that we are God's children. So who do you think you are? You. Yes, even you, Christian friend. You are a chosen race you are a chosen race and secondly you are a royal priesthood again Peter uses Old Testament language the language to describe the church in the Old Testament is now used to describe the church in the New Testament you are a royal priesthood this is a quotation from Exodus 19, the verses 5 and 6. We read, the Lord says, You shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Now in the Old Testament, the office of priest was restricted to Levi's descendants. It was they and they alone who could offer sacrifices and, uh, and pray and intercede for, for the Lord's people. But that now has changed in the New Testament. All because of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ who has made one sacrifice for sin forever. And is now ascended and sits at God's right hand. And we can with confidence now enter into the holy place by the blood of Jesus. By the new and living way that he has opened up for us. So in other words, something radical, revolutionary happened as a result of the finished work of Jesus. Remember when Jesus cried upon the cross, it is finished. Coincidentally... Remember what happened, the, t uh, the curtain in the temple, it was torn from top to bottom. And so the way into the Holy of Holies was now opened up figuratively. But now actually, God has opened for us a new and life-giving way. So that now you and I don't need a personal priest, a descendant of Levi. But now, according to the teaching of the New Testament, every single one of us are priests. The sacrifice has been offered that takes away our sins, but as we shall see, we are still to offer spiritual sacrifices. And as priests, it is our responsibility and also obligation and delight to intercede, to pray, as priests do. So we are a royal priesthood. Why are we royal? Because we serve the king. The king of kings. The Lord Jesus Christ. That's who you are. A, a, a royal priesthood. And so as priests therefore... We should, as we were reminded last Lord's Day, we should be offering sacrifices. Not bloody sacrifices, but spiritual sacrifices. As David says in Psalm 51, the sacrifices of a broken and contrite heart the Lord indeed will be pleased with. That's a sacrifice that we are to offer. Sorrow for sin, something that's not apparent in the lives of God's people today. 
doesn't seem to be much sorrow or repenting or many tears shed over sin. But this is a spiritual sacrifice. We're also, as Paul says in Romans 12, we're to offer our bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God. And so we're to be continually offering our bodies day by day, not just Sunday morning, but Monday, Tuesday. We are to offer our bodies on the altar of God. We are to be devoted. Everything we have, everything we are, is to be devoted to the Lord. It's his. We are to offer the sacrifice of praise. Hebrews 13, 15. Let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. As we give our gifts to the Lord. When they're given in the right attitude. They are a fragrant offering to the Lord. When we do acts of kindness as unto the Lord. They are as a sacrifice pleasing to the Lord. And even the Apostle Paul saw us preaching among the Gentiles as a priestly duty. He says in Romans 15 verse 15, Because of the grace given me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, serving as a priest of the gospel of God, my purpose is that the Gentiles may be an acceptable offering sanctified by the Holy Spirit spirit and so who do you think you are you are a chosen race you are a royal priesthood that's who we are is that how we live do we by God's grace do we fulfill these duties these functions, these obligations of being a royal priesthood. And then thirdly, Peter says, not only are you a chosen race, a royal priesthood, you are a holy nation. Again, another image, metaphor taken from the Old Testament, this time Exodus 19 verse 5. You shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So when God brought his people out of Egypt, he was wanting to form them into a nation that they would be distinct, that they would be different, that they would be set apart, that they would be a holy nation. And that's really the root idea of holy. Set apart. Different. I mean, the Sabbath day is to be a holy day, different from the other weekdays. And this Bible that we're reading from, it says on the cover, Holy Bible. Bible just means books. And so this book we have is holy. It's set apart. It's different from all other books. And Peter says, you are a holy nation, writing to these scattered believers and writing to us today. And that's what we are. We are a holy people, a distinct people, a people set apart from the world. And one of the perennial temptations of ancient Israel was to imitate the immoral and irreligious practices of their neighbors. They were constantly backsliding and ultimately that's why they were taken into exile because of their unfaithfulness. And that's a continual temptation and snare for God's people to be infected by the spirit of the world and become like the world, lose our saltiness. Remember who you are. You are a holy nation. And so by our lives, by our speech, by our behavior, 
we are to be distinctly different. Not holy Joes that people would laugh at and despise, but living genuinely godly lives that people find striking and attractive. As one writer says, we therefore ought to be recognizably, visibly, and substantively different as the people belonging uniquely to the Lord and therefore representing his character and his ways. It almost seems to me that today it's kind of trendy and fashionable and encouraged for Christians to blend in and to be like the world and the theory is then you can approach the world. That's not biblical. We are to be a holy nation. We are to be different. Our lives, we have different aims, different values, different standards. We have a different goal. We have a different master. Our lives are altogether different. And so it should be apparent. It should be even a visible thing. I mean, even as you left for church this morning, you were maybe the only one in your street that drove out, drove down the road to come to church. That's a witness. And even fewer come to an evening service. Well, that's a witness even to neighbours. Well, God must be important to you. And as they look at our lives, we should be living lives that make the Lord attractive. These are people who don't read the Bible. And so perhaps the only Bible they do read is your life and my life. And so we are to be a holy people. The way we keep the Lord's day is to be different. The programs we watch, the things we do, the way we speak. You are a holy nation. So who do you think you are? This is what you are. And by God's grace, that's how we ought to live. So you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And then fourthly, a people for his own possession. Again, another phrase called from Exodus 19, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples. Uh, most of us here, I think we can hardly get the translation of the authorized version, the King James, because it translates, you are a peculiar people. Well, now, that may be true of some of you, but I don't want to be peculiar. So that's a, an example of how words have changed their meaning. That was fine in 1611. Perfectly good. Perfectly good. But peculiar now means a bit odd, a bit strange. And I don't think we want to be thought odd or strange. Some of us are strange enough. But the ASV is a very good translation here. You are a people for his own possession. The same term is used in Malachi 3.17 of believers who respond to the Lord's rebuke and live righteously. There we read, They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, in the day when I make up my treasured possession. So who do you think we are? We are God's treasured possession. We, have, we are his property. We are special to him. We belong to him. And he will protect all his property and guard all his people. He will lose none. He has promised no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. He cannot lose or neglect or abandon any one of his children. The prophet Isaiah asks, can a woman forget her nursing child or lack compassion for the child of her womb? Even if these forget, yet I will not forget you. 
And so that's who you are. These original readers who were exiles, who were scattered, who were suffering, you are a people for his own possession. You may have lost your home. You may have lost material things. But you will never lose the Lord because the Lord will never lose you. The Apostle Paul says, Who can separate us from the love of God in Christ? Can affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to, to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And how must that have sounded to Peter's original readers? A valuable reminder. This is who you are. A people for his own possession. Who do you think you are? That is who we are. Christian friend. But then he goes on in the verse to say, you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellences of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. So Peter tells us here in this text who we are. But then he tells us secondly, what we are to do. What are we to do? That you may proclaim the excellencies or the praises or the virtues of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. This is our statement of purpose. This is our raison d'etre. This is the purpose of our calling. This is what it's all about. We are saved and sanctified in order that we may proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvellous light. No better reason given here. Look at what the Lord has done for us. By nature we were in darkness and darkness is a picture of, of, uh, of ignorance and uh, of deadness. Men love by nature darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. And that is a picture of what we are by nature. We are sons of Adam. We are, we are the fallen sons of Adam. We are sinners by nature and practice. We were in darkness and in ignorance. But just as in Genesis 1 when God spoke the word and there was light and darkness was dispelled, that's what God did when he converted us, when he renewed us. He called us effectively and he shone the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ into our hearts, into our lives and enabled us to embrace the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord. And what a transformation that was. A change from utter blackness and darkness and ignorance into his marvelous, wonderful light. Yes, note how Peter does describe the transformation. It's out of darkness, not into mere light, though that would be good. But it's marvelous light. It's wonderful light. Isn't it, Christian friend, to be in the light of the gospel, to know God as your heavenly Father, to know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior? It's wonderful, isn't it? You're not sure? It is marvelous to be a Christian. And who has done this? The one who made the first creation also made a recreation. For if anyone be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, For God who said, light shine, Let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts 
to give the light of the knowledge of God's glory in the face of Jesus Christ. And so because of what the Lord has done for us, because of who we are, we're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. What better people are fitted and suited to proclaim the excellencies and the virtues of the Lord? I mean, who else is going to do it? Only those who have been redeemed. Only those who have been brought out of darkness. Now that we have discovered the light of the gospel, the truth of the days in Christ Jesus, we are the ones who are entrusted with this task to proclaim his excellencies, his virtues. So how do we do it? One writer says, the declaration of God's praises includes both worship and evangelism. And that's one reason why I chose Psalm 96 to begin our, our worship this morning. I can't think of really a better call to worship. Read it again. Linger over it. Just reminding us of what, who God is and what he has done. It extols his excellencies and his virtues. So as we gather here, Lord's by, Lord's Day by Lord's Day, we seek to do that. We seek to proclaim his excellencies. But also, we declare his excellencies by telling others who do not know our great God and Savior, who don't have a Savior like you and I do. And so we need to tell others because who else is going to tell them we're the ones who have this good news i mean if we had the cure for cancer would we keep it a secret we have the best news possible that there is a savior who has overcome sin and death and the devil and god forbid that we should keep this a secret because the fact is, those who are around us, family members, friends, neighbours, if they do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as Saviour, they're on a broad road that leads to destruction. They're on their way to hell. That's the fact of the matter. And we have a message which is life-changing, which is focused on a person, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he is the only one who can save lives and transform lives. And so evangelism is done by word and by deed. It's like the two wings of an aeroplane. It's by what we say and how we live. Both are vital, both are necessary. People need to hear. And ordinarily, it is through the word of God, by the spirit of God, that God calls sinners to himself. And so they need a witness. And that's what you and I are, Christian friend. We are to be his ambassador where he has planted us. By our words and also just by our lives. Paul writing to the Corinthians says of the Corinthian believers, you yourselves are our letter, known and read by everyone. You show that you are Christ's letter, not written with ink, but with the spirit of the living God. So there you have it. And so often when people don't have a Bible or don't even read a Bible, not even interested in reading the Bible, there is a book that people will read, and that is you and me, the character and the direction of our lives. And so we are all a witness, but what kind of a witness? An effective witness, a good witness, or a bad witness? Someone has put it like this. Your life is Jesus to someone 
though tattered and torn it may be. Though oftentimes weak and unstable, you're all of God, someone may see. Your tongue is Jesus to someone. That idle, insensitive word reflects to at least one searching heart an idle, insensitive Lord. Your goals are Jesus to someone. What you put first, they believe, are the goals of God for the Christian. Your life is all they receive. Your faithfulness is Jesus to someone. Their judgment of how God is true rests unquestionably in the faithfulness they see day by day in you. Your love is Jesus to someone. That someone who is seeking to know that Jesus will follow and guide and befriend wherever in life they may go. So beware, lest others blaspheme God by what you say or do. For the only Jesus that someone knows is the Jesus they see in you. And so that's who we are. And this is what God calls us to do. That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. And what a, a joy as well as a duty that should be to be able to tell others. And so, friend... When was the last time you told someone of the excellencies of the Lord Jesus Christ? So who do you think you are? You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. And what are you for? that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. Let's pray. Gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the sovereign, amazing creator God that you had the power just to speak the word and all that we see was made out of that which we can't see. And we thank you that you have that same power in salvation. You can speak the word. You can call your people and we come at your summons. We acknowledge, O oh Lord, that you are King of kings, Lord of lords, that you're gracious, merciful, compassionate, incredibly kind. When we think that you should have chosen us, that you should have called any one of us, and when we think of ourselves, and when we know in our heart of hearts the wickedness and the corruption and the vileness that's hidden away in the depths of our hearts. We do not know why you should have chosen us. But we thank you, O Lord, and bless you that for your own reasons and for your own glory, you set your love upon us. We thank you that you sent your only Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to be the propitiation for our sins. We thank you that we have peace with God. We thank you we have life everlasting. We thank you that the last enemy, death itself, has been defeated and destroyed by the glorious resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And so we thank you, O God, for making us what we are by your grace. And pray that you might, might uh, part us with your blessing. And as we seek to live quiet, faithful lives, we pray that you would enable us also to witness a good confession and to speak a word for the Saviour 
and to be able to give a reason with gentleness and meekness of the hope that we have. O oh Lord, we pray for the salvation of our family members, for those who are lost all around us. And pray, gracious God, that you will prosper your word, your gospel, and be pleased to use us, O oh Lord, as available servants, that we may be a willing people in the day of your power. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.